Hello everyone, I'm Kate Braug and this is The Pivotal Moment. Together we will talk to 100 of the most inspiring and powerful women entrepreneurs in New York. They will tell us about what it takes to set up your own company, how to be the architect of your own career, and how they are reshaping the business world. I'm an entrepreneur myself and I'm looking forward to hearing their stories along with you. Today I'm speaking to Elaine Kwan, and when you hear about all of Elaine's accomplishments, you might doubt she exists in real life. She's a Carnegie Hall pianist, she taught piano at MIT for 20 years, she holds a black belt in Taekwondo, she's been a guest on the Oprah Winfrey Show, she's been featured in numerous magazines such as Vogue, Elle, InStyle and Runner's World, and 10 years ago she founded her own company named Savor Your Senses. Elaine's company creates multi-sensory, immersive experiences in which all sensors are triggered. Elaine, thank you so much for being a guest on this podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Kate. It's really great to talk to you. When we first met, um, which was about four months ago, I don't know if you remembered, but I clearly remember thinking, wow, this woman has a vibrant energy. And we quickly realized we had a lot in common, including that we both grew up outside the United States and now share a deep love for New York. Can you tell us what New York City means to you? Oh, gosh, I love New York so much. Uh, I dreamed about living here when I was a kid. Um, And I actually uh, grew up most of my life in the U.S., but I was born in Korea. Um, And then my family moved to this small town in eastern Washington. And, you know, I grew up in wheat fields and kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, And I was always fascinated and obsessed with New York as a kid. Just like the tall buildings, the lights, all these people. You know, I was obsessed with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino because that's all I knew of New York was from the movies. So that's why I thought it was like Broadway musicals and taxis and things like that. And it was all so wonderful to me, you know, growing up in the country. Um, and, And I dreamed that someday I would move to the city the big city. And I'm here finally, you know, I, I moved here in 2003 and I, I don't want to leave. It's just, you know, it's giving me, um, it's actually, it's given me my ideal life. I guess I could say in a nutshell, um, you know, cause to me, New York is, means freedom. It means open-mindedness. It means opportunity. Um, and the way that my life has gone is that those are all the things that I craved when I was younger. And how did New York help you in your work? Uh, Well, there's so many people coming in and out of the city. It's really a crossroads of the world. And in my field in music, and now with Savor Your Senses, um, there's an influx of people who, who are all here to like share ideas, to create something, to make things happen. Um, And that's, perfect for what I do because I, I'm I, I'm in a in a field where we're trying to reach as many people as possible through music through events through communicating to expressing um, it's there's no place like it to be able to to constantly be inspired and, and um, find fresh ideas and, and new ways of thinking you know so yeah I guess it's just the, the opportunities that are available here as opposed to really, any other city. It's hard to explain, yeah, right? As you know, to I, people who have not. I completely here. agree. I mean, it's a it's a thing that has to do with energy and um, drive and ambition and motivation and um, having so many different different people in one city. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, you started playing the piano at a very young age, and I think a lot of us wonder what it's like to dedicate yourself to a craft your entire life. Um, can you tell us what was most important for you to keep on pursuing what you love? Oh, gosh. Um, a lot of things, I guess. that There's not just one one thing, but I, I think I was fortunate to find something I was passionate about very early on. You know, I, yeah, I started piano when I was four, and there wasn't much else to do in, in the small town where I grew up. And, you know, I, my parents were immigrants, and... And I was very lonely as a kid. And so I practiced and I was able to identify as a pianist early on and found I could express myself, you know, and and realize that's what I wanted to do. Um, when I 
uh, was in high school and was graduating. I mean, I was competing and doing concerts, and, and it was my whole life. Um, my parents did not want me to do music, specifically my father. Um, why why was that? He was dead set against it. Um, he just wanted... You know, it was out of love ultimately, but it, it just it was really hard. It was really, really hard at the time. Um, in fact, that was, that was a, a, a turning point in my life for sure. Um, be, he just wanted us to be comfortable and safe and not struggle as they did. So they wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or something very sensible and um, not necessarily easy, but just more stable. Um I think that's this is true for a lot of um, kids of immigrant parents. Um, and so he didn't want me to do it. So I had to defy him and pursue it on my own. So that fight, you know, that that stance that I took, I think that was um, <laughs> a real strong purpose that I had to be able to keep pursuing music my entire life, to pursue what I love. I had to fight for it. And I think that's the case if someone tries to take something away from you that you really want to do and you love, that's when you realize you have to actively stand by it. Um, and that sense of purpose, I think, <laughs> it lasts a lifetime, you know, and I have to say, like, my purpose has changed with in, in phases, like, you know, small term goals. My first, my purpose was to just, you know, get away from Pullman and to be able to go off to college and, you know, and take the scholarship that was that was given to me and, and you know, do it on my own. And then my purpose changed to be able to get through school, you know, and keep keep my grade point up to keep the scholarship uh, you know you know at each level it's changed so you would say um, that you kept on setting goals for yourself along the way when goals you had set you'd fulfill yeah i guess you could say that it, it's, it's the the goals were steps i along the way i guess that's a, a good way to to put it but they were driven by this purpose of wanting to do what I love. And that's... But when you started, do you have a clear end goal in mind? No, I didn't. <laughs> and I think that's why I said my, like my purpose and goals have changed. I didn't when I was 17 and graduating and having to, you know, just break my, my parents' heart, you know, by doing music. Um, I didn't know what, where it would lead me. I just knew that Music was the way I expressed myself. It's the way I moved through life. And if I d wasn't able to do that, I just don't, I didn't know who I, I was. Um, but I, f I think what, I, uh, what I've found along the way is that, you know, you, you grow up, you mature, you find, you do what's in front of you for a while and, and then accomplish a goal and then learn from it. Do you, do you, I don't know if I'm being really clear on this. Yes, but no, that's very clear, actually. Yeah, like my, you know, my first goal, like you had said, there were goals, I was just to just to get away and just to be able to study music. And then, okay, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, you know, like working in the summer, playing in restaurants, like doing, you know, all these <laughs> things to make money to, to, to support myself and then graduating. And then, oh, what do I do next? Like taking the the regular steps. I took traditional steps along the way until I found that I, you know, I don't have to follow these traditional steps. I can, I can expand and be more of who I am. It took a long time, you know, being Asian, that's a lot of, <laughs> and having Asian parents, I'll tell you, it's, <laughs> To break it's out of the break out of the structure. <laughs> yes, yes. Like I was so strict on myself. But and so you said that your father wasn't very supporting of um, you playing the piano. Who were your most influential role models or sources of inspiration if you couldn't find it at home? Well, I've had m many different people, not just one. Um, I I have to say that uh, actually my martial arts instructors were very influential to me along the way. Um, I had always wanted to study martial arts, even since I was a kid, because my father was a martial arts expert in, to, in addition to 
all the other things he did. But and I would watch him like kicking on our patio and I and you know like kind of hitting rocks and things like that. And I wanted to do it, but I I wasn't allowed to do it because they thought I would hurt my fingers for piano. So finally, when I was getting my doctorate um, in in Boston, there was a uh, there was a taekwondo team, and I joined it and. Uh, you know, I started when I was 25. I was just so happy. And, you know, I started there. And then I started studying with the grandmaster um, who lived in Lowell, Massachusetts, in New Hampshire. And then from from him, I learned so much about he was he became like a father figure to me, um, someone I could trust to talk about things with. And he introduced me to Grandmaster Jun Rhee, who was responsible for bringing Taekwondo really to America. Um, and and I toured through Korea with his with his Taekwondo team for and we performed um, for U.S. soldiers based in Korea. The qualities that you needed to persevere in Taekwondo um, it, are those the same qualities that you use to pursue playing the piano? They are very similar, and I found that it it wasn't a, a, any kind of a you know. A hardship to be able to do both, because um, I know people have said, "Well, how can you, as a pianist and a musician, you know, how you can do piano at your level and also do martial arts?" At, yeah, how do at, you how do you deal with the muscle ache? A uh, muscle ache. <laughs> <laughs> well, the muscle ache is really that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I love feeling sore and and you know, like having little aches and bits, because then it feels like I've really used my body and, and, and not that I've been training. It's a good feeling. But it doesn't interfere with, with the piano. No, not at all. Not at all. It, because, um, well, first of all, I'm very careful. You know, I don't do stupid things and I, I don't compete in sparring, even though I, I had to do sparring to, to be able to get my black belt. Uh, but um, I am very conscious of that. Um, but training martial arts has made my body stronger, my mind stronger, and that helps in music. Like I don't, I don't get tired as quickly. I have endurance. Um, you know, hours of sitting at the piano can cause all kinds of aches and pains, um, maybe even more, you know, <laughs> than, right. right. And martial arts just undoes it all. Just the range of motion, you know, the, the kicks and the stretches and moving the core and, and all of that, they're very complementary. And, and the same thing of, like, of learning as well. It's, you know, I know you were trained in dance, right? It takes right. A, a, a lot of discipline to be able to practice something over and over, to try to get it right, um, to, to sit down and practice four hours, even though you don't want to do it. And this is the same thing. It just applies directly to martial arts as being, it, to me, you know, going through the motions of the forms and learning the moves and the kicks and the stances, it was so comfortable to do that because it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, right. two different art forms. Yeah. I would like to talk about teaching for, for a moment. Um, you taught piano at MIT for a very long time. Um, when did you start teaching and what was it like to teach piano at a university like MIT? Oh, yes. I started teaching at MIT in um, 1999. It was one of my first teaching jobs after getting my doctorate. And I just love teaching there. It was, it's been a wonderful experience. And, and that's why I've commuted back and forth from New York to Boston since 2003. It's just, it's a long time, you know, going back and forth. Um, I guess first, first, it's a very well-run university it has a it's just a strong commitment to excellence, and you can feel that in every department, including music. Mm -hmm. um, and and then on the other level, it's so fun just to interact with these really inquisitive and quirky, just highly intelligent and focused students. Uh, it's very energizing, and you know a a great thing about MIT is that. For the most part, the students are self-motivated and they all want to do well. It's very hard and competitive to get in, you know, so once in, they, they're, they're, yeah, very they're rewarding. Exactly. very rewarding. Yeah, they're so self-motivated. And, and so 
already from there, there's so much to work with, right? You know, I don't spend my time trying to push someone to learn. They want to learn. And then when you have that established, there's just so much you can do. And, and um, I, I really, really loved bringing music into um, the lives of students who, who necessarily were not majoring in music, right? So to them, right. music was a, an added joy, being able to use their brain in a different way. Um, and their love for it just fueled my love for it, you know? So it's, right. it's been great. It's just been so great. How, how would you describe your style of teaching? Um, let's see. I would say it's interactive, um, fluid, and personalized. That's how I like to teach, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one lesson or in a classroom. If it's a classroom setting, I like to get to know each person as much as I can individually. And I had that chance too, because I would also teach piano in the piano lab. And many of my students would take um, individual piano lessons with me. Um, I really like to get to know um, the individual because everyone learns differently. And it, it, to me, it was, it was fun to be able to figure out how that person can process information, you know, so then that I can help deliver it in a way that they can learn the best. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, each, each person, each class. Um, so in that way, uh, yeah, I could say it's fluid, if that makes any sense. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. You, I remember you saying you like to be quite hands-on, right? Yes, you, yes. You, how, how important is that to you? Uh, it, it is very important, um, meaning I like to be, well, for piano, if, you're, we're, if we're talking actual piano lessons, it does help yeah. to be sitting next to the person and, you know, correcting the way their wrist is or helping with the fingers, helping with posture, with the way the arms should flow as you're playing a phrase. Um, piano in itself is very hands-on um, and hands-on, I guess, in a different way because when, uh, you know, I'm like teaching fundamentals of music or theory, I like to be able to engage um, asking questions and get feedback personally from each student as much as I can. What advice would you give to people who want to learn to play the piano in their adult life? Oh, don't hesitate to start. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> seriously, piano is one of the best instruments to learn later in life, I think. I mean, I'm a little biased because I love the piano, but all the piano keys are laid out right in front of you. I mean, you can see all the notes, right? And then you have your 10 fingers right in front of you and you just place the correct finger on the correct keys. So first of all, you don't have to worry about creating a pitch or knowing how to tune, do you know? Right, right? like the violin, for yes. example. I played the violin for a while and <laughs> that was, it was quite hard to finally find um, the right tone, right? But yes. at least at the, in the, on the piano you have... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Don't have to worry about, yeah, making that tune. Whatever that comes out of that instrument is what's going to come out. Um, you right. know, it, there's a, a whole level of other things to think about when you play, you know, coordination. And of course, there's so many things to think about. But um, it's possible to play music that sounds good very quickly on the piano. So yes. I love teaching adult beginners. So you've achieved a lot in the world of fine arts. Um, what are the challenges that you faced? Um I can't speak for all the arts, yes. but just from my experience in music, um, they're just, I guess, limited opportunities for just either performance or limited opportunities for, you know, money so that you can make a living of it. Um, because there are a lot of extremely talented, smart, accomplished musicians, and, the, and they're all vying for these this tiny pool of opportunities. You know, whether it's um, you know a concert series, you know, at Carnegie Hall or or even anywhere, or or for a teaching position, you know, somewhere. It's very competitive. It's all these people trying to get just little tiny amount of opportunity. So that's a challenge um, in the music world. How did you face that though? Well, I guess I faced it by trying to create something of my own, which is, you know, which would savor your senses or a find a way to branch out of the traditional classical world 
and move in into a realm where I could engage more people, you know, because classical music, it's, it's such a beautiful arena, but very few people know about it or have access to it even. Um, it's, it's changing and getting a lot better these days, which is good. Um, but when I was, you know, getting out of school and starting to really know who I, I was, you know, I'm still learning, but, you know, getting stronger about being comfortable with what I wanted to do, not what I should do. Um, I just found that if I created something outside of just classical music, then it, there's more opportunity, I think. Is that the advice you would give to young women uh, pursuing a career in music? I, I think so. I would. I mean, first of all, you know, you'd want to Anyone who's pursuing a serious career in music has to make sure that that's really what they want to do, for sure, because there's so much sacrifice, so much dedication, and 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 <laughs> the reward is is variable for that much effort. Then next, yeah, I would tell somebody who, uh, you know, perhaps a young woman to say, okay, really, like, know what where you are in music like what do you what voice do you want to have and then stand by it and then work on building it find your own distinct personality in it you know if you're if you're going to stay traditional and play just only classical music then what voice do you bring to that what do you offer the most and then do everything you can to build on that right yeah True to the title of this pod podcast, um, I'd like to talk about the pivotal moments in which your life shifted direction. And I'd like to talk about one moment in particular, because two months ago, you decided to take an extended break from your job at MIT to fully focus on developing and fine tuning your company, Savor Your Senses. What was the catalyst for making that decision? Well, uh, I think there are several catalysts. Uh, you know, la last year... Um, well, first of all, I, I'd been doing Savor Your Senses um, since really 2009. I mean, we, we created the concept then and we did our first event in 2010. Um, mm -hmm. But it was always kind of a side thing, you know. It, it's, you know, it was sort of we'd just do events every once in a while. We never advertised it. We didn't really market it. And and it kept going and, and slowly growing, right? And then we'd do them and then I'd, you know, start teaching the school year and It would go on hold, right? And then it would kind of start up again and years and years of this. But this last year in particular, um, I took the whole year off. It had only been one other time that I'd taken one full year off. Um, and I, we had so we had set up these events all over the world. Actually, I, I spent a month actually um, being artists in residence in Taipei and playing concerts and teaching there. And we did a Save Your Senses, went to Hanoi. We went to and did a beautiful one actually also in Luang Prabang. You know, we were in Barbados, South Carolina, in Chicago, I, all these places last year in particular and started to gain momentum. We had been gaining some momentum in the last few years, I'd say, handful of years, um, which would get a little stunted when I'd start teaching and then start up and I thought, okay, maybe it's time to just, we had such a glorious travel year and thought if I can spend 100% of time on it, um, I'd love to see where, where it goes, you know? And um, so we had a bunch of events set up for the spring and in summer and into next year. And, um, you know, and of course then the pandemic happened. So <laughs> so I guess the, so I guess the catalyst for making that decision was just I just thought I'm not getting any younger. You know, I already started Savor when I was you know, I'm not I'm not young. I'm, it's just it's not like I'm in my 20s or 30s trying to, you know, build a company. I wish I wish I were younger only for that reason. I would just have more time in front of me. Is that um, something you would have changed if you could? I wish I would had I wish I had um, yes, yeah, started earlier, or maybe had more courage back then in my early 30s to just, you know, kind of go full force on what I wanted to do. I, I you know, I had I was pursuing music and I built my my career and, and my path. Um, 
as best as I could, but always fighting, you know, that, you know, fighting either my father's disapproving voice, right, in the back mm-hmm. of my head or or actually literally trying to 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 not fight with him. I mean, he, he's since passed, but just there was always, he never even, he never understood what I did. And so, yeah, there's all those issues. Um, yeah, I wish I could have started becoming an entrepreneur earlier on. I mean, switching from a creative career to being an entrepreneur is is a huge cha- uh, change in direction. Um, what were the challenges you faced since you founded Savor Your Senses? I'm not trained in business. You know, piano is is what I know. I, st- I have all my music degrees, <laughs> undergrad, master's, doctors in piano performance. Um, that's all I did as a kid. Hours. I didn't. I don't even really know how to swim. I don't really know how to ski. Anything. All those things. <laughs> like other things that like other people who. Uh, Maybe I might have learned uh, right. growing up, right? Full progress on piano. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all just piano and music and trying to survive, really, right. and, and and you know keep going with it. I, I mean, there was a lot of obstacles I had to I had to go against, but um, um, that's a challenge is is trying to um, run run Saver as a business. You know, because uh, that I'm I'm learning that and and maybe getting better at it. Um, I am learning also. I mean, some of the challenges is finding um, the right people to bring into the company or to work on it with me. Um, I I can't do it by myself. I you know I. <laughs> Or even with with my co-founder, my husband. Um, yeah, I wanted I wanted to talk to you about that. <laughs> you co-founded the company together with your husband, and to me, that sounds like a dream. But I do <laughs> want to know um, what is it really like to run a company with your spouse? <laughs> well, <laughs> for I I have to I, I know because I've heard, I've heard and, and actually looked into other you know companies that are run by husband and wife team. Um, I love it. I. I and, and I feel very lucky, and I'm knocking on wood here, uh, because we get along really well, and he is my best friend. So, um, and my and my confidant, like you know, I I count on him for a lot of things, and and we complement each other, so it works out. Um, he, well, uh, up until recently, he had a you know a day job all these years, um, but he has more of a much more of a business head than I do. Um, so he was very helpful in that way. He would handle like business development and, um, outreach if, you know, all the, all the, the, the business types of talks and emails he would do. I could focus on the creative aspect of, um, curating every event that we do, which, you know, they're all customized, working with the artists, bringing in the chefs and the winemakers and, and the dancers and anyone who's involved in a Saver event. Um, that's what I love to do, the creative side of it. So it works. It works, you know. I mean, and if I need to ask him he's in the other room, I can just go talk to him about something, you know. Very convenient. <laughs> Especially now, he's literally just in the other room. And if you could, because some people might not know what uh, Savor Your Senses is, how would you describe the essence of Savor Your Senses? Savor Your Senses is about you know creating shared experiences where people come together and they can be fully present in the moment and savor their lives. I mean, that's why we created is we wanted to 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 be able to guide people to focus and appreciate individual elements that together are greater than the sum of the parts. Um, So for example, a piece of music, um, rather than just listening to it, we add the taste element where you can enjoy the piece of music, the story behind it paired with maybe a beautiful glass of wine that has that shared story behind it, um, and they tie together and have some unity, just like food and wine can pair together and make the experience better. Music and wine or music and food, music and chocolate, those together can be 
even better. Um, so yeah, we just want people to be able to specifically focus um, and guide them through it and create a shared experience and tell the stories behind it. <laughs> so yeah, it's just savoring all these little pieces in a very conscious way, you know, purposeful way. If you would describe the difference between a Savor Your Senses event and going to a more conventional concert, what would it be? A concert's a great way to enjoy music. Um, a Savor Your Senses experience helps you know, expose the message of that music or the key themes or the ideas um, of each piece that directly tie into another sensory element like the features of the wine or the food or the element, uh, other elements that are paired with it. We're purposefully preparing each music selection with a matching wine or a matching concept or a matching food. So that, right, so you would have yeah. one theme and everything else um, answers to that theme. Yes, I mean, sometimes we'll have an overall theme for the concert, for the, for the event, and then each piece might have its own pairing element, you know, uh, like imagination might be the, the concept of this music piece paired with this special glass of wine. And then, you know, play the piece, you have the wine expert, then discuss what imagination means, you know, in delivering this piece of this, this glass as the audience sips it as I'm playing the piece. So there's, there's conversation, there is, um, uh, focus, I guess that's, you can say we're, we're, we're guiding audiences to specifically focus on the portion that we're featuring. Does that, does that make sense? So we're all focusing on the Definitely. same element together. Then it's a shared experience. Definitely. Uh, yeah. And what, what is your future vision for the company? We already have a platform. I'd like to expand it. Um, we're working on um, trying to create online pairings of music you know, and other sensory elements, um, you know, build more partnerships. Not many people know about us because we have been under the wire. We don't really market, <laughs> right. you know, but, but just to, you know, build the, the three-legged stool, I guess, the events with marketing um, and with um, partnerships. It's interesting that having done this outside of New York in many places around the country, and we're starting to, you know, of course, do it globally, uh, there, there's so many other places where people would love this and have loved Savor. So um, I, I would like to make it more global, but not lose quality. When we first met, um, you said something that stuck by me and truly resonated with me um, because I asked how you would feel about people who duplicate your idea and pretend it's their own. Um, and you said you struggled not to let it affect you, but then you said it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, I'll still be here and I'll still be working. And I think that sentence really showed character and determination, but where do you get the strength to keep on going when things are tough? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, that comes from a lifetime of um, a lifetime of having to struggle, you know, against either people opposing what you're doing or or trying to hamper it. Um, <laughs> and this is where I wouldn't give up all those years. You know, I say I want to I wish I had started this when I was younger, but then I would have given up on all of years of just finding out who I am and being tested over and over and over again in situations so that I've had to become stronger and had to become more determined, you know? Um, so the strength comes from, you know, every person that ever doubted me, every kid that ever threw rocks at me for being Asian, you know, or, you know, my, even my father who just up until, you know, gosh, it wasn't that long ago. And he's just like, you need to settle down and just, and just stop, stop doing what you're doing, right? It's every person who says that. Even even I had a, a, a family friend who was like testing me with scalding this, this test with scalding hot water, washing hands to see if I could handle it. It's all of that. Every single test is like, okay, you know what? Bring it on. <laughs> just, just keep it coming because I will be standing at the end, no matter what. You can't learn that unless you've gone through it. You can try 
and that that um, uh, idea of that this is you know I'm going to persevere, I'm going to do it. That's very good. Everyone should have that. But unfortunately, you have to have then actually done it right. As we've all noticed, we're currently affected by COVID-19. Um, we're in a historically strange time. Um, how are you adjusting to the current living situations? Because events are social gatherings. <laughs> um, and as we're currently social distancing, how are you modifying the business model? We're trying to f figure out how to make Saver communicate online because we're we're just just expanding our efforts like to bring pairings of music and other sensory elements to be able to translate online. Eventually, we're going to be able to go out into the world again. We have some ideas actually for one of the first events we're going to do. That is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait, actually. I'm, I'm, I can't wait either. <laughs> Elaine, thank you so much for being a guest on this podcast. Um, I'm looking forward to see what you'll do and well, where you take Savor Your Senses. Um, for everyone at home, thank you so much for listening to the Pivotal Moment podcast. Um, don't forget to subscribe and feel free to leave comments and questions below. Next week, I'll be talking to life coach April Hanna about what it takes to coach women entrepreneurs on their path to success. Stay tuned.